Good morning. I was in Essel Day School a week ago, and um, when I looked at the second years, I felt like one of these great aunts who comes along and says, my, haven't you grown? <laughs> I was last standing here in August, and it is an absolute delight to gaze out at you shimmering, shining, splendid ones. It really is. And thank you for the glorious worship. I really didn't want that to stop. So let's not let it stop. Why don't we do this? Why don't we put our hands on our hearts and just gaze at the one who is altogether lovely? The one who is radiant in his splendor, dazzling in his beauty. Holy Spirit, I ask for myself and everyone here and everyone listening online today that you would give us fresh sight of the darling of heaven. That you would break open our hearts to receive him afresh, fully, that we may utterly understand beyond all comprehension this glorious gospel. Thank you that you're here. You know, when I was preparing, I was in um, a prayer meeting with my online team and I kept seeing Jesus popping contact lenses into people's eyes and it was with me all day yesterday and today. I um, had contact lenses for the first time when I was 30 years old and I can remember sitting in the opticians, no glasses on, waiting for them to come and everything was just a bit of a fuzzy blur. Now, I could have sat there all day in the opticians, listening to every conversation there was about lenses and glasses. I could have been a dispensing optician and have studied fully everything you could possibly know about lenses. But until I willingly received those contact lenses popped into my eyes from the optician, I didn't receive the miracle of that fresh sight that day. And there is, as Saran said, it's a, like a fireside chat. We're going to focus on the beauty of the king. I had um, an experience, as I often do, on a bus back in the autumn that wasn't actually one of the most remarkable or awesome experiences, but it was one of the most tender and special good news experiences I've ever had. I just have to give you a little bit of detail because it's relevant to how much Jesus chases us down to share his love. Um, I needed to upgrade my phone and the kind mobile shop was doing the transfer of data and said it would take an hour. I went back after the hour and they said, oh, we had some sort of like mini power cut and your phone was the only one affected. So we're slightly delayed. It's going to take about 14, 15 more minutes. And I thought, shame, because I'm going to miss the first train, but that's okay. I pick it up, I go to the station, the train I should have caught well on its way back to where I live. The next train has broken down just outside the station and there will be no trains for two hours. So I think Uber, as did probably 50 other people and all the Ubers had been taken and then I went in search of a bus. And it was rent a crowd at the bus stop by then because we'd all piled out to find buses. But happily as the bus arrived, the doors stood in front of me, I'm one of the first on. And I'm excited to try out my new phone, wouldn't you? <laughs> so I'm sitting down thinking, I've got a good 30, 35 minutes of peace here. Um, I've, got, oh, I've definitely got emails to catch up with, WhatsApps. And I'm well in when a lady comes and sits next to me. And it's not unusual on a bus for people to comment about buses and times and the weather. <laughs> I'm waiting for that to finish. I'm not inviting the conversation because I've got my nice, dazzling new phone. <laughs> And um, so I'm doing, being polite, you know, yeah, 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 but look, I am doing business here. And um, then she starts telling me about a pantomime ticket. She's so excited she managed to acquire. And then she says, is that an iPhone? And I was like, yes. And she then pushes in front of my face a Samsung and says, I've got this screensaver on here. I don't like it. Do you know how to change screensavers? <laughs> it's like... And I wasn't actually feeling like there was a word of knowledge or this was like a miraculous encounter. So I'm carrying on. And then from the depths of my spirit, I heard the Lord say, 
would you love her for me? I nearly cried. I felt, Lord, I'm so sorry. Of course I will. And I packed my phone away and gave her my full attention. For 10 minutes, she was telling me a whole variety of stuff. And then she asked me how come I was on the bus, was on the bus every day. So I explained the backstory. And then she said she was also upset. She was delayed because by the time she got to her home area, it was going to be dark. And she never, ever goes in the dark from the bus stop to home. It's not a safe area. And she was really frightened. So I said, I'm a Christian. I know God loves you. And I know he doesn't want you to be afraid. Could I pray for you to have some peace? And she said, well, that's remarkable. I've just started going to an Alpha course. Have you ever heard of these? <laughs> and I said, yeah, yeah, I, you know, I have heard of them. And she said, that would be lovely. And she put a hand out for me to grab it. I prayed, peace. She said, that's so sweet, that's so amazing. And then she stopped in her tracks and she said, God must be real. And I said, what, you know, what's making you say that in particular? And she said, well, don't you see? How many angels would it have taken to delay your phone and only your phone for 15 minutes to break down that train to take all the Uber taxis and get you on this bus? And she said, how many people do you think on this bus would offer to pray for me or would know how to pray for me and give me this sense of peace. God must be real. So I got up my phone and I felt to, lead to show her Psalm 139. You know about, he knows us standing up, sitting down. And I was having as much of a revelation as she was going through this little Bible app. And we had a Bible study for about 20 minutes. And at the end she said, oh, I wish you were my neighbor. I'm sure I'll never see you again. But thank you, I know God is real. Amazing, isn't it? Do you know what that did for me? I thought, that's someone who doesn't even yet know him. She wasn't claiming she was yet a daughter of the king. How much love he had for her heart and her concern that he wanted to demonstrate who he was. You know, the good news of the gospel. I was thinking and reflecting the other day how overused good is. You know, I even get the Americanized version now with shop assistants for many years who don't even look up at me as they hand me my shopping and say, have a good day. And when I might bump into an acquaintance, they might say, oh, good to see you. I've even got a friend who's training a puppy. And when the puppy finally retrieved a ball the other day, she said, good boy. And there's a sense to me that the gospel, the good news, even though we do steward good news so well in Essel, and even though we know what it means, it can sometimes fade from our sight. In the Oxford Dictionary, I looked it up, the adjective of good means to be disled of, having the required qualities of, of a high standard. And I thought, really? That's it? That's the good news? I was reminded, um, talking to a homeless guy on the streets once and sharing the gospel with him, and he replied, whoa, Flipping heck, that is the best news I've ever heard. Actually, he was a bit more fruity than that, but I can't actually <laughs> say it. So I was just thinking, why don't we just remind ourselves of something of the gospel? I want to um, just read some verses from Colossians 1 to you. And, you know, just hear them with fresh hearts. Colossians 1, 13 to 23. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Get your heads around that. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. <laughs> 
Guys, this is good stuff. The firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. We were alienated, weren't we? So jump to 27. It says, To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Do you know that's the gospel? That is what we're talking about. That splendid, awesome, glorious powerful, amazing, phenomenal, outstanding news that will make people laugh out with reliefs of joy, inexplicable and full of glory, that will make you weep with the delight and the wonder that you don't have to do anything. Jesus is standing before before the Father as you. You don't have to cleanse yourself. You don't have to redeem yourself. You don't have to do anything because you have believed in Christ and you are the redeemed ones. You know, I had um, realized that I've had many times in my life where there have been the most awesome experiences. And I had two and a half phenomenal years in Essel, seeing miracles and salvations and glorious things happening all around me. And they all came to a shuddering halt with the lockdowns. And, you know, it was three weeks to flatten the curve, which went on for several months, in and out of lockdowns. But in that first lockdown, I had a dream which was so real, I honestly thought I was there. And I've shared it with some of you before. I was in Gravesend, walking along the street, and Jesus was actually walking along with me. We were in love Gravesend to share the gospel, and I thought, my God, Goodness, what is going to happen today? Jesus is actually here. What miracles, what salvations are we going to see? And I was skipping along beside him when he turned and looked full in my face with absolute love, but with sadness. And he pointed over into a little kind of alcove of a shop where there was a door that was probably boarded up. And in the dream, there was this little battered leather chair and a little table and a lamp. And he said but I've been waiting for you there. And in the dream, I had full revelation of what he was saying. He was saying to me, you've loved the miracles, you've loved the salvations, you've fully partnered with me and so enjoyed the works of my hands, but have you really known me intimately? Have you really given time to just be with me? How many husbands would enjoy the love of a wife who was so excited about the presents and the gifts he brought, so enamored with that diamond ring, but not so bothered about just being with them? And, you know, in that dream, I started crying, and I woke up sobbing, and I mean ugly crying, snotting, (laughs) Just, just broke my heart. I couldn't believe it. Now, there's nothing wrong with the miracles, you know, and there's nothing wrong with the gifts. Paul tells us, doesn't he, to eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Jesus gave us the Great Commission. Um, Clearly, we're to go into all the world and make disciples, but it was almost like I was one of these birds that had this very muscular, you know, well-developed wing this side and a little bit of a weaker wing this side. How would I expect to soar to the heights and be able to rest with him? So I just realized that, in effect, you can cheat on God with even the things he gives us. Even ministry. Even the good stuff. Because other things can dazzle us and consume our time and our attention. He, I found, didn't want anything coming between him and me. No other loves that were either between us or higher than us. At that point, virtually every book on my bookshelf would have been about healing or prophecy or evangelism or the gifts, all of the outworking. 
Daniel Kalenda, some of you may have heard of him, is president of Christ for All Nations. He took over from Reinhard Bonnke. And they have these massive, glorious crusades in Africa where literally hundreds of thousands are in these fields. And they see miracles, signs, wonders. Astounding. And he's made this quote. He said, after the crowds have come and gone, and hundreds and thousands have been won to the Lord, I sit on my bed in that hotel room, and it's still only God that satisfies. Eric Gilmore said, I'm not trying to stop believers from accomplishment. Rather, I just want to emphasize that anything that has significance to God must issue from him, his presence, his voice. God is a living individual to be continually experienced and interacted with. He must be preeminent satisfaction and empowerment in our life. You know, when I looked back, I could see that God had punctuated my life with his love and his presence. But I didn't seem to know how to build almost a container that was leak-proof, that would carry that living relationship that I really ached for. All those powerful worship moments like we had this morning, all the healings, the miracles, the salvations, the Bible study, fastings, none of them really were enough because I would go to astounding conferences and three days after that beautiful honeymoon period would start to evaporate amongst the pressures of life. And it was like I didn't know how to translate that corporate power to that private intimacy that would carry me through. And, you know, if you'd know me in Essel, you'd think, well, but Janice, you saw so much stuff. You know, God was with you. But they were gifts. You know, I shouldn't be any more impressed with having been a lawyer and having a sharp mind or being tall as a woman than I should be by laying hands on the sick and seeing them healed in the moment. I am immensely awed and grateful, but I also know I didn't personally do those things. So in those lockdowns, I actually had a double lockdown, which some of you are familiar with in my case, because in the spring of that first 2020, I damaged my back in a really hideous way. And if you recall, there wasn't a lot of hope of getting any medical attention at that time for anything other than the emergency of COVID. There's no way I could get a physiotherapist to my house. All I could get were painkillers. And it ended up with a chronic condition where I wasn't able to sit for more than one or two minutes for two whole years. I would only stand, walk slowly, lie down. I couldn't sit and kneel at all, and it was physically exhausting. Ten days into the agony of that initial terrible back problem, I had another dream. And I woke, I thought, awake at 1.30. I looked at my clock, it was 1.30. All the shadows would be as I would imagine they would be that time of the morning in my room. And I was aware, hanging taking up maybe a third of the room was this transparent heart. And as I kind of clocked it, I felt invisible hands lift me into this heart. And it was just so comfortable. I remember thinking, my goodness, it's, I was in so much pain and all the pain was just resting away in this mattress of this heart. And I suddenly realized it was the heart of Jesus. And up to that point, I'd started to really get frustrated that I wasn't getting healed. I'd seen healings. My own back had been healed from a devastating break. Years back, I was meant to be in a wheelchair and I, and I got completely healed. I knew about healing. Surely this wasn't going to be a problem. And so I initially prayed in rest. And then I prayed with fervor. And then I started fasting. And then I worshipped. And then I got friends to pray for me on Zoom. And... I was getting to that point where it was almost I was feeding the miracle machine <laughs> with everything I could, because if I could get all my little ducks to line up in a row and pull hard enough, the miracle would come. So I'm in this heart, and this voice, which I knew to be Jesus, simply said to me, stop trying to get healed. I've got it covered. Rest in my love. 
And as I heard those words, a wave of love hit me. And my heart became to really smolder. Then another wave hit me. And it's like it started to glow. And then another wave hit me. And I start to respond in love back to Jesus. And I have no idea whether this was a dream or a vision and encounter, but it was so real. And I don't know if it lasted minutes or hours, but it ramped up and up and up to the point of bliss I, I cannot possibly describe to you. And it was so intense. I actually thought the next wave of love, my heart it cannot contain it, is going to explode. And I had this moment of absolute fear of the Lord and absolute overwhelming love and bliss held together. And I almost braced myself, thinking I'm going to die in the heart of Jesus, but oh, what a lovely way to go. <laughs> I mean, I know it's weird what you think when you're in those encounters. And as the next wave come, I'm back on my bed, lying there. There's no heart in the room. And all I'm aware of is I need the bathroom. <laughs> So I was in agony and I started to just gingerly shuffle because I would be crying out with the level of pain I would experience. I thought, that's interesting, I'm not in agony. And instead of pushing on two crutches to get off the bed, I pushed on one walking stick and instead of inching, I took little steps. About 80% of the agony had gone in that encounter. Now, wouldn't you think, if you experienced something like that, by the morning, I'm going to be fully healed? Certainly by the weekend, you know, obviously by next month, first of the month, that's when it's going to happen. But it didn't. Two whole years. So I was doing ESOL, um, day school had gone online. I was working for clients on Zoom, in, on the healing centre online, three hours every Saturday. And many days, I don't want the violins out, but many days I had to decide between having a lie down at a lunch break or having some food because I couldn't do both. And the pain would just build up. But even when Job's comforters helpfully came along, the Christian friends who say, hmm, have you looked into this? Or is there some hidden sin? Or what about your real faith? None of it touched me. And I just lived in the expectant hope of healing, which could be at any time. He said he'd got it covered, but I primarily rested in his love. And I basically, metaphorically, was at his feet, having the far side chat that Irene saw. And... Um, enjoying Jesus. Uh, I'd got plenty of time, and so it seemed had he. And we enjoyed each other's company, and I began to learn what it meant to prioritize intimacy with him. Now, I know we've had time worshiping Jesus this morning, but I'm going to ask Chris at this point, I did forewarn him, to um, pop up back onto the stage. Because I don't want to just tell you about Jesus this morning and excite you about the encounters I've had. I want you to encounter him. And all we're going to be doing is recognizing he's here. You've enjoyed him so much, such glory in the worship this morning as we've sung of his holy name. So as Chris starts playing even now, all I want you to say quietly under your breath is I love you Jesus and even if you don't know him you can ask him to make himself real to you this morning you can just use a word like worthy or holy don't worry about what anyone else is doing you're not performing you're in a relationship just speak to Jesus. Hold that sustained awareness of his love. As you adore him, behold his beauty. And just inhale him. Do you know the sweet bliss of his presence is sustained? in that adoration. It settles your mind. It satisfies your longings. It makes
makes him all your desire. So I'm going to leave you for a few minutes. Love him and let him love you. the scriptures say you make known to me the path of life in your presence there is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures for evermore So don't let me disturb anything that's happening between you and Jesus, but there's a little more I wanted to talk to you about. Because prioritizing our love for Jesus is so immensely important. You know, in the book of Revelation, the glorified Christ addressed messages for different churches it's interesting that every corrected church in Revelation had one core issue, a need for a fresh revelation 
of Jesus. And he speaks in chapter 2 to a church of Ephesus, but it's a timeless message for every believer and every church of the vitalness of first love. Now please know I'm not saying anything in any way to rebuke anyone here or at all Gateway, not Gateway, Eastgate or me. I'm not. I'm preaching to myself. I'm simply wanting to demonstrate how vital and essential love for him first, him having the preeminence above all other loves. You know, even in Matthew 22, Jesus taught, didn't he, that the greatest and first commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and voice. So I'm just going to bring up Revelation 2, 1 to 7, because I just want to notice a few things about it. What really struck me is how impressive this church was how impressive these believers were. Because Jesus starts in verse 2, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. But you have in fact even tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently, and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. I mean, I'd be pretty impressed (laughs) with a believer or a church you could say that about. So their doctrine was pure. Their perseverance and persistence like Navy SEALs. These guys knew the truth and they worked hard at it. And then Jesus says, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the work you did at first. So he spoke about first love. I was just thinking... Can you remember the day that you got born again? Maybe it was a process for you. But I remember. I remember the weight of sin that just effortlessly lifted off my life. I remember waking up the next morning just gazing at the wall next to me and this verse just popped into my heart. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It resounded through my whole being with such affirmation. I was almost breathless with joy. I was at university and over the following days and weeks, I saw beauty in everything. I know it's a common probably thing for many of you. I felt love and compassion, even the really scary homeless guy who had kind of jumped on me and begged for money only the week before, I suddenly felt such love for him. And I couldn't wait to get back to my little bedroom and my velvet golden beanbag and sit there with an open Bible and Jesus. And scriptures that had been so kind of opaque and confusing to me in the past, I mean, I could cope with the Gospels, but I mean, the epistles, I just gave up suddenly they just leapt off the page. Those truths burned into my heart with profound revelation. I didn't need the discipline of my daily bread notes I've been given since a child to just make sure I at least read a verse of scripture every day because delight had overtaken discipline. I was devouring the Bible. I was underlining everything, even some of the begats, even the titles Jesus said, the scriptures speak of me, and boy, did they. I wanted to climb into those scriptures. I wanted to just nestle in, abide, and experience those loving, breathing words until they became mine. 
You know, I didn't need to intentionally evangelize anyone in that term because they approached me asking about my new boyfriend. <laughs> and they wouldn't believe me when I said, no, I haven't got a new boyfriend. I had one of my friends sit next to me in the lecture and she said, well, do you fancy the lecturer then? I said, no. But I was in love and I couldn't hide it. I was too in love to join in with the gossipy critiquing and you know, stuff that goes on with same year groups. It was so simple, I could not take my eyes off the one I loved. There's a quote here, the satisfaction of the soul is not some perk of his presence, but rather the means by which he empowers and frees us to obey him. There was um, a kind of oily, buttery ease in obeying him in so many things in that first love. Most of you would know that the Welsh revival is considered to have started when a young girl, Florrie Evans, in 1904, just stood up and said, I love Jesus Christ with all my heart. To be in love with Jesus means to love being with him. You know, I've been in love myself in the past in human terms. We've all seen people in love. No one has to tell lovers to find time to be together, do they? You don't have to persuade them of the benefits of each other's company. They can't even stop thinking, dreaming, speaking about each other. You know, you can sit with a friend who's newly in love and all you're going to hear is how delightful and wonderful and glorious and have I told you and oh, he said this the other day and you should have seen when he laughed at that. And lovers will go to ridiculous lengths just to spend some time. They'll travel miles. I know Pete and Kim did this. You know, even to spend time in a car park with each other for maybe 30 minutes. And they crave that aloneness and they feel lack when they're apart. Witness Lee said, the Christian life is a life of daily experiencing the Christ we have received. The Christian life is a life of experiencing Jesus all the time. Doesn't your heart just salivate for that? For his continual presence? You know, Michael Koulianis of Jesus' image when he was first wondering how to start a ministry, he went around asking the greats, what do I need to do to start a ministry? And every answer came back. Just find the love of Jesus and love him back. Because everything flows out of that. Ephesians 3.10 in the Amplified is my prayer for us all. And that you may come to know practically, through personal experience, the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience. That you may be filled up throughout your being to all the fullness of God. So that you may have the richest experience of God's presence in your lives completely filled and flooded with God himself. To say we love Jesus looks like something. It feels like something. It's measurable. He wants every one of your senses to be alive to him. He wants you to be thrilled with the sound of his voice. He wants you to be thrilled with the touch of his hand. He wants you to be thrilled at the sight of his face. He wants you to be deeply moved at his presence as he comes near. So said a glorious saint, Ruth Heflin. Gazing at him. You know you can do it any place, anywhere, 
in the midst of anything. I was in um, a situation some weeks back where people were getting a bit irate and intolerant and judgmental of one another and the conversation was not going well. And I was actually feeling wounded by how they were with one another and I was catching some of the flack. And I just started just under my breath singing to Jesus how he was more precious than gold and silver. And just in here, I was just saying how much I loved him. And within about 30 seconds, it was like they all forgot what they were arguing about. The atmosphere completely changed and sweetness filled the room. And I had another different experience where um, I was being misunderstood in a work situation. And it was actually really bothering me and there were so many deadlines and I had one of those kind of stress headaches and I was trying to concentrate and type something up on my laptop when from nowhere I was just enveloped in sweetness. It was so otherworldly, I just had to stop what I was doing because I didn't know how long it was going to last and it was so, so precious and I thought someone is praying for me I just know someone's praying for me and I was just musing with the Lord who's praying for me and he came straight back I am <laughs> you know he lives ever to intercede for you boy his prayers it's like I was just caught up with him in heavenly places so gazing at him I would say there's no other offer on earth that's more profound intoxicating and exciting no other thing I have discovered is more life changing it transforms everything our relationships how we see ourselves the church, ministry, and others. You know, in reality, we all have a deep longing to behold and to be held by him. So I'm shortly going to um, be winding things down and coming into land, but I would just say, is there a clearer way to say the becoming is in the looking? And they that look to him are radiant. The psalm says that, doesn't it? Psalm 34, 5. Those who look to him are radiant. I sometimes think that we as individuals and as the church are what I saw in a book title one. It's like we're Cinderella with amnesia. It's like we've just forgotten whose we are and who we are. And really that song Jesus you're all I want (laughs) you're all I've ever needed when I was preparing for this I wasn't waiting on Jesus for a talk I was simply waiting with him and enjoying his presence when I just slipped into one of those visions where it's just like you're just there and then you're out of it And in this, I saw myself standing here and I saw a dove come through that back left window and fly close over the heads of the people and just hover here. And the Holy Spirit, in the form of that dove, as he hovered, a little pool started to form beneath him of crystal clear water. And it grew until it became like a baptistry that extended all the way across here with steps going down into it. It was like a pool of bliss, of life-giving living water. And I'm going to invite the band to come back up because, you know, it matters not how much we know of methods or doctrines or power. What really matters is the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Knowing God's Son in this way, 
because God, knowing Him is the way. Knowing Him is the truth. And knowing Him is the life. Our power, our obedience comes from knowing Him. All that God gives us is in Jesus. Hence the whole question lies in knowing him. So when do you have first love for Jesus? When he alone captivates you and only his presence fills you with overwhelming joy. So I felt that Holy Spirit had an invitation for us this morning to come to come to the waters to come and be baptised afresh in first love to come if you need reigniting to come to this pool of bliss to come to the front it's a prophetic act to come if you need healing in body, mind or soul to come and let Jesus lift you high. We don't ever want to recover Jesus from sight of you, from your touch. We don't want any other agenda but you. With one accord we ask, come, touch every heart, Come, everyone. Come if you thirst. Come to his living waters. Come and be baptized in his love. Come to your beloved. Thank you, Jesus. I know that that people have gone off for the children and we're overrunning, but we're not going to rush this. Man thinks time, but God thinks connection. So again I say, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Jesus, you who made streams come out of the rock in the desert and cause water to flow down like rivers, we thank you for the purity of your holy presence in this place. We come to the river, to those pools of bliss, we come with our hearts open to receive your full, all enveloping heart of love, your gaze for us, Jesus. You just make room for people who want to come through so that they can come. Just come you want to come through just come through it's fine you're pushing for brothers and sisters you're not being rude come to the waters come in